Companies operating in today's global economy really need to get an understanding of the international geopolitical risk landscape. At Infortel Worldwide, we work with our clients on solving risk before it starts. Welcome to the Riskology Podcast, where we're looking at managing business risk globally and really understanding the geopolitical risk landscape. So welcome everyone to another episode of Riskology by Infortal, where we cover the entire spectrum of geopolitical risk events and really look at economics, finance, risk, and how that can impact your business both globally and here in the United States. I'm joined again with Dr. Ian Oxnavada, our head of geopolitical risk at Infertile Worldwide. We are really excited to bring another guest into the Riskology fold today, and that is Matt Kelly, the editor and CEO of Radical Compliance. Those of you in the compliance circles, I'm sure you've heard of, seen, and probably even watched Matt on a various spectrum of podcasts that he's been on recently. He's also a member of the Compliance Podcast Network, along with Ian and I. And I would say that if the Compliance Podcast Network had a walk of fame, Matt Kelly would easily be in the top five. So Matt figured before we jump into our topic of the day, which is the world of AI, we'd stop and see how it's going, how your year is looking so far. Thank you very much, guys. It is a pleasure to be here. Thank you for that kind introduction, which I did not pay either Ian or Chris to give for everybody who's listening, just out of the kindness of their own hearts. Things are going well for me here. We certainly have a lot we can talk about. But usually I find that January is a rather slow month for business and compliance news, but not in 2024. We've got plenty that's going on. That's right. Yeah. Usually slows down in January, but guess what? We just hit February. So now it's time to ramp it up. So let's jump into it here. AI is on really, it's on everyone's mind across the board, no matter what sort of discipline you're working in. But we thought today it would be really interesting to get your take on the, the state of affairs and the approach from a compliance standpoint to AI in the current risk management landscape? Well, you could talk about it from any number of directions. And in fact, I think that's actually probably the biggest challenge around AI right now is that it can touch so much of your corporate enterprise in so many different ways. It's really hard to get a sense of what you're supposed to do or where you should start. For example, we could do a whole podcast if we wanted just on regulatory risks around using AI, which we could, and there are such risks, or you could talk about ways that AI might benefit compliance and audit and risk management professionals, which is also very true. You could talk about how the corporate board should be thinking about AI and how do they govern its use in their company. How does the existence of AI change the strategic objectives and plans you might have? How does it challenge the risk management systems that you, the board, are supposed to oversee? We could go on and on and on. And I was recording a podcast just the other day on third-party risk management, where many of the questions that we were asking were about how AI can affect do you, company, use it for your third parties? What about if your third parties are using it so you can go back and forth and round again with AI? It's going to be a fascinating long-term challenge. It's so true. It, it does seem to come up in conversation, no matter, again, what type or what level of business that you're talking about. It's really in front of mind for everyone, both as a tool, but also somewhat as a concern. And I know you have a, a deep history in terms of looking at compliance issues through the lens of ethics. When we think about AI, something that sort of stands out to me is obviously you've got the whole science fiction discussions that are happening of where this could all lead. But if you take a step back and really think about it, it's humans and individuals that are still making the key decisions and sort of putting up the guardrails and shaping what this can look like in the future. So from an ethics standpoint, how important do you think it is to sort of pause and really sort of make sure that we're taking the ethics into account in the right way? It's a very good question because I think the fundamental issue here is that AI automates the exercise of human judgment, whereas technologies before that automated human labor and calculations we might make, things like that. But this is more about how AI looks at a set of circumstances, decides what to do, and then it does it. Well, that's what people do. And people do that rooted in our 
background, our experience, and what we have decided as our ethical principles and the moral priorities we have. So if AI is mimicking and automating that, then it too should have the same sort of ethical principles and moral priorities that we humans have. Easy to say. How do you actually put that into the code? I'm not a technologist. I don't know. And it's more about how we stop and actually have to define what our ethical principles are so that we can be sure, you know, we're not going to ever be able to look at an AI doing its thing and figure out out of the two trillion parameters it has, which I believe that is the number of parameters that ChatGPT uses to process things, you can't say, all right, we're going to change these three parameters out of two trillion, and now it's going to be less biased against certain groups. That makes about as much sense as saying, if we just zap these three brain cells in the person's head over here or over here or on the back or on the left or the right, if we just zap those three brain cells, the person's going to be less biased. That's not how the brain works. That's not how AI works, at least I think. But we humans will never be able to figure that out. So we need to look at what is going into the AI. What's the data it's studying to reach its conclusions? What are the outputs and decisions it's making? And are those things reflective of our ethical principles? And like, I haven't sat down to do a formal analysis of this yet, but I don't think that is how the human brain actually works. The human brain, our ethical values and moral priorities are sort of inculcated into us and they permeate our decisions all the time so that we don't really stop to think about it all that much unless we see somebody else doing something wildly different. But most times we don't. So I'm not necessarily sure that we have fully thought through how do we bake ethics into AI when we don't bake it into? I even just used the wrong phrase. We put the seeds of ethics down before it works, and we look at the harvest of AI's work afterwards through ethical lenses and compliance lenses and cybersecurity lenses. And I think that's going to be a challenge for a lot of organizations. I think that's really insightful. And you know, as you mentioned, without even thinking about AI, it's challenging. So once you bring in the complexity, of the unknown in terms of capabilities and sort of how the innovation path will flow in the near future. It's really difficult to bring ethics in. Ian, I'd like to bring you into the conversation because we've definitely looked at sort of the AI usage within the disinformation space and bad actors sort of already trying to harness those tools. What do you think about sort of the capability of us for organizations to build ethics into the AI frameworks? So this is a problem that no one's talking about when they talk about AI, because everyone knows kind of instinctively that AI needs to be regulated or there needs to be an AI approach or culture in how companies and even governments and individuals use it. But at the same time, we talk about ethics as if everyone is agreeing on this sort of same ethical standard. And we're assuming that we actually have a grasp of our own human nature almost implicitly in these discussions. And I don't think that we do. Who's ethics? where are those ethics coming from? If we're going to train it in AI and we're going to obviously feed it on human created data or works at some point, what does that actually look like? And where do those ethics come from? And I don't think there's a solid agreement on that. And until that is even there, I don't think we can have it at a quote unquote universal ethical standard for AI. I don't think it's possible. I mean, if we're talking about it automating human judgment, we're running a risk of potentially automating the worst aspects of human nature. So there was a French philosopher, Blaise Pascal, who's a mathematician. He was also fairly theologically minded. And he was arguing in one case in this book about how evil or bad decisions were, I guess you could say just the negative aspects of human nature are pretty universal and very empirically founded. You can find it in any history book. You can find it in any example, if that's the case, if that's the default and ethics are something we have to positively work at, but we don't know what that objective is, I don't know how you can bake that into an AI system very well. And even if the human beings who design it are great, if it automates those judgment calls without active human participation and active ethical participation, I'm worried, even if there's no 
quote unquote, evil genius using the AI, human beings are lazy. And if you can let AI do those judgment calls for you to a negative effect on your business or on other people or in government, and if you're talking about states, we're going to clearly weaponize it when they can. I think we're in for a wild ride. I think that's absolutely right. And I think based upon this conversation, we've at least firmly established that the ethics questions and the ethics dynamics are not going to go away anytime soon. But on a positive note, I think it is good that you are starting to see these types of dynamics discussed more openly and at the top levels. It was definitely part of the main conversations at Davos, a lot of times through the lens of disinformation, but still, I think there is a push at the top level to have more of these conversations as the development really accelerates. But let's switch gears a little bit away from sort of the ethics outlook. And let's think in terms of practical terms, because we're seeing a lot of tools that have immediate firm value in terms of efficiency gains, in terms of, you know, looking at the overall operations and finding innovative corners that weren't possible before. What do you think, Matt, based upon the conversations that you've had with chief compliance officers is the biggest challenge there in terms of bringing AI into the fold, but also making sure you're not sort of opening up a back door to something that you're not trying to bring into the fold? Well, for compliance officers specifically, what they are trying to not bring in through a back door is some sort of regulatory violation. So what strikes me the most isn't necessarily how are we using AI. It is more, how is the company adopting AI? And to that extent, as cool and wild and profound as AI might be, it is still just another new technology. We have had new technologies before. So the challenge for a lot of organizations, I think, will be how do you govern the adoption of this new technology? And I didn't specifically say AI. I suspect that if we could turn the clock back to 45 years ago when they first introduced spreadsheets, there were probably organizations saying, well, what does this mean? Who owns spreadsheet risk? And today, that makes no sense for us. Mm -hmm. Perhaps our grandchildren 50 years from now will all be saying, what do you mean who owns AI risk? You know, they might not get it any more than we would understand about spreadsheet technology, but it is really all about the senior people in the organization. Do we know who is embracing this new technology? Do they, we know how that they are doing it? How are we sure that we know this? Do we have a policy for them to bring it to us first so that we can make sure they're not using it in a way that introduces risk or causes a compliance violation? How are we testing this technology to make sure it works? And I can give you some very good examples already of big companies who have failed those tests. But that's not necessarily specific to AI. We had a lot of companies 10 years ago really mishandle how they rolled out social media. 30 years ago, we had companies not really sure how they should be using the internet. How are we going to use cloud-based services and privacy and cybersecurity risks there? None of this is really new when you think it's just about how are we making sure we know what's going on within our four walls with this AI thing that people are playing with. That's a great way to look at it. You mentioned social media just at the end there. I think there's a lot of parallels if you really think about how fast social media exploded and sort of the different platforms that suddenly became available. And I think the way that it was developed and the way that it was released, there's definitely a lot of lessons learned. You know, Zuckerberg was back on the Hill just earlier this week. And so there's a ton to unpack with what just happened with social media. And one of the hopes is that as these discussions move forward, both in the compliance departments, but also from a regulatory standpoint, is that we take some of those lessons learned from social media and maybe consider applying that to how we're approaching regulating and obviously the follow through compliance with AI regulation. And, you know, the White House did come out with an executive order to try and put some high level guardrails, but Honestly, it still has that feel that we had as social media really kicked off in terms of it having that Wild West kind of feel to it. Where do you think we'll go, Matt, from a regulatory standpoint? As I mentioned, we have that executive order, but do you think certain agencies are going to take more of an interest in this than others? Yes. So right away, I could say, for example, the Federal Trade Commission 
will take more of an interest in this than some other agencies. The Commerce Department, under that Biden executive order, they're going to, by the order's decree, take a larger look at AI because, in theory, if we're going to have this cybersecurity red team testing of powerful AI, well, who defines what a powerful AI is? The Commerce Department is going to do it in consultation with other agencies. The Securities and Exchange Commission has already talked about AI washing as a thing where companies might be puffing up the amount of AI they're actually embracing to goose the stock price and investor interest. Is that an interest in AI in particular? You tell me, because the SEC will go through these kicks from time to time. Greenwashing about ESG was two years ago. That was a thing. There will be something else. You know, is this an investor issue or is it an AI issue? But Chris, the other point I would want to make is that as we all wait for new regulations, let us remember a lot of pre-existing regulation out there can already lead to some very difficult enforcement situations around the use of AI. I'll give one quick example is the Federal Trade Commission. Just the other month, they sanctioned a retail pharmacy chain. I won't name them here, but they were using AI to do facial recognition as customers come in the store, compare that to a database of known shoppers. If there's a match, then you are a potential shoplifter and we're going to round you up and maybe call police or escort you out. The problem with this being that they didn't have any controls for the quality of the database of shoplifters they were looking at, the quality of the images, and they hadn't really done any thought about what if the AI gives us a false positive flagging someone as a shoplifter when they're not. So that led to bias against certain racial groups. It led to a lot of harassment of very innocent people. It caused a big mess. But that was all just, do you have quality controls? Have you tested your technology? Is this invasive of somebody's privacy because you haven't told them you're scanning their face as they come into the store? None of that has to do with AI. That is consent. That is testing. That is quality control. Those were issues long, long ago. And so a lot of it is just the apparatus already exists to have some really nasty regulatory falls if you are not careful with your technology management. Happens to be AI we're talking about, but it could be anything. So true. And a compliance nightmare can also be a, a litigator's dream. And so my wheels were spinning as you went through that example in terms of the different angles that someone could attack that scenario. And I think one of the challenges with the technology, because it's so untested, a lot of firms are testing it in real time and in real live conditions. And that adds a layer of risk, which really has to be considered before you roll out these tools. Circling back to what you said, one area that I think can give a lot of comfort to compliance teams and risk teams is that fact that we've got all of these regulatory apparatuses in place that can apply to AI. And so that can be a place to start to really digest how your firm plans to approach creating policy, creating sort of documents to surround how you plan to use AI going forward. So there is a starting point. It's not as though there's nothing to look at. So I think that's a really important consideration. So Matt, on our podcast, we don't really get through an episode without discussing world events and the impact that even compliance risks can bring to world affairs. And so to kick us in that direction, Ian, what are your thoughts in terms of AI over the next year and the impact on global conflict? So if you look at Davos as sort of a gauge of how conflict is being approached by, I would say, a critical mass of policymakers and influential people around the world, it's interestingly not number one, even though it probably should be. Misinformation was number one. We talked about this on our last episode. But you can't separate that from conflict. There's going to be an interest in using AI and deploying it as a tool to sway elections, to attack cyber infrastructure, to attack potentially physical infrastructure, to tarnish reputations, to steal data and commit some sort of other cyber attack or potentially even access something that can be weaponizable. I think it raises the stakes of getting something wrong exponentially because Again, you're automating certain decisions and you have the ability to create false realities that can then induce poor judgment on the part of other actors 
the likelihood of a global conflict is going to go up as a result of this, but just simply because of AI. So if you just look at elections, one bad election could potentially tip the balance of power in Eurasia right now. You know, you can't separate out what's going on in Ukraine from what's happening in the Middle East and potentially Taiwan. Those are all interconnected because you're looking at a potentially Eurasian conflict. That's what this is about. It's about who controls the 21st century and to do that, who controls Eurasia. And you have major elections. You have one in Russia. Are there motivations to get rid of Putin? Absolutely. Are there motivations for Putin to stay in power if you're looking at his use of potential AI to create a conflict? Of course. There are tensions between India and China. Does China have an interest in swaying India's election? Absolutely. Does the U.S. have vulnerabilities in China potentially using that to sway the U.S. election? Absolutely. And I think that there's no real guardrail available for that because there's no central law enforcement or regulator when you talk about geopolitics. We like to pretend that there is with things like Davos or with things like the U.N., but in reality, that doesn't exist. So because of that tool being at that level and those interests related to these conflicts already at play, I think AI is going to fit very dangerously in that dynamic. Yeah, definitely good insight there, Ian. Matt, so we'll bring you into the waters of world affairs. Interesting from a compliance standpoint as well, because we can regulate and we can set policies here in the United States, but if things are looking different in Europe or across in Asia, you know, the technology can take shape in different ways, regardless of what's going on here. So interested to maybe get your thoughts there in terms of differences in regulation internationally. That is a good question. And the short answer right now is that we don't know. For example, some people listening might already know that the European Union has adopted the Artificial Intelligence Act. However, without getting too far into the weeds of EU politics and legislation, just because they have adopted a law does not actually mean that that law exists in its final form and it's ready to go into effect. It's not. We can say that, yes, the AI Act in Europe will outlaw some things, such as using AI to create a social score for residents or citizens to make sure that they are good doobies, according to the supreme rulers. Now, that is something China does right now. It already has social okay. score for its citizens. And Europe is saying, we're not going to allow that. There are going to be other privacy concerns or cybersecurity concerns that I know the EU Act will eventually address, but even finding a text of the existing Act is not easy. There's still going to be a lot of negotiation before a final version of this law goes into effect, and then it's probably going to have to be transposed into national law. This is a long-winded way of saying that the EU will probably regulate AI shortly after the sun goes red giant and incinerates the earth. I think they're usually on that. That's right. Whereas the United States, yes, we have this executive order. Yes, we have a lot of pre-existing regulations that can help to regulate AI. But, you know, if the Biden administration does not get reelected in 2025, a presumable Trump administration is probably going to go in a very different direction. I have no idea what it might be, but there's a certain not even volatility, but unpredictability in long-term U.S. policy that's really difficult to figure out. So I do think that a lot of how we use AI is going to be driven more by private concerns worried about risk. Corporations have a great incentive to pay attention to how they're using AI, wholly divorced from any regulatory issues that may or may not come down the line because there is tremendous risk. You could have cybersecurity risks from here to kingdom come that you will have to address, that AI will make these risks worse, and it will also help you fight them better. But you're going to have to engage with AI, and that has nothing to do with what any government might do on regulation. It's just you have an incentive to try and figure this out. So, you know, if you're asking what are the regulatory regimes going to look like, I can kind of sort of predict that by 2030, the U.S. and Europe will have regulatory oversight that's somewhat similar, like cousins do have a family resemblance, and China's going to do something wholly different. And then there are going to be whole swaths of the world that either they won't address it, or if they do, their markets are too small that it really it's not going to make much of a difference. But how will India address this? 
I don't know. I don't think anybody knows. I'm not sure the Indians have figured that out yet. How will Russia use it? Probably for very ulterior motives that are not very good for anybody other than Vladimir Putin until he goes. What about after he goes? You know, so there's going to be a lot of incoherence, I think, for a long time. I think that's absolutely right. And what percentage of the population is it, Ian, that's going to the polls this year? It's more than ever before. And yeah, so it's like, I think a billion people. I, I mean, just to chime in on what Matt was saying, I think one way to look at this is to how the market of characteristics of each country, how AI is going to affect that. So if you think about India, for example, India is an interesting case, as well as China and Russia as sort of counterexamples. Russia, just based on their cyber attacks and their use of cyber attacks and cyber warfare, it's pretty safe to say that, you know, that's a natural fit for AI as well as economically, just the way that their economy is structured, even if you're not talking about, you know, a Putin or somebody like Putin using it, oligarchs are going to have motivations for it, state-owned industries. China is going to use it for mass surveillance. I think that's very predictable. India, in adopting it for commercial reasons, has kind of a conundrum on its hands because India has become such a, a powerhouse in the service sector, especially in tech. How many of those jobs is AI going to potentially wipe out? And for a country like India that's developing, that creates a massive economic and political problem where if AI wipes out too many of those jobs, that destroys their model. At the same time, if they don't adopt it, that could also just potentially leave them obsolete as Western companies and others go even more into AI and use that to automate systems that right now they're outsourcing to India. So if you think about it from that regard, India has, from an economic standpoint, much more to lose if they get this wrong commercially. Yeah, we've unpacked so much today and really we're just scratching the surface. I think that's where we started, Matt, in looking at all of the different areas that you could really discuss AI through, the different lenses you can discuss AI through. Something that you hit on at the end there, Matt, and I'd be interested to getting your take on it as we close here, is the fact that a lot of the power and a lot of the influence really sits with private enterprise. And so the way that private enterprise goes in the next couple of years could really set the tone. What would be sort of your advice for, you know, those that are in the position to make these key decisions in 2024, Matt? You know, somewhat to my surprise, I do not know that I would have given this answer 12 or 15 months ago, was that I don't think you need to panic about it. I have been struck by how many people are not intimidated by, say, the rise of generative AI and how many people are not originally went through a panic that, oh my God, ChatGPT will leave me unemployed by February 2023. And that hasn't really occurred. I don't know that it ever will occur. Maybe it will, but so far I have found so many more people actually after a moment or two thinking, wait a minute, I can really use ChatGPT to help me do my job better already. There's all sorts of productivity gains that can be reaped here if you use chat GPT and AI generally, not just generative AI, but any AI. If you're using it smartly, there are a lot of productivity gains and society does not advance without productivity gains. So I've been surprised to say that we don't necessarily need to panic about it from a commercial standpoint. Maybe the warriors out there and the cybersecurity people out there and the geopolitical considerations, maybe they work on a different timeline. But private industries, no, assuming that you're actually engaged in thinking about how does my enterprise use technology? How do other enterprises use technology that may affect me? You know, what benefits does it bring me? What risks does it bring me? What benefits and risks do I get from others using AI? either to weaponize it against me or they become better business partners for me or they become new commercial threats. You know, like you have to think this through and there are matrices you can look at to help you get some sense there. But I will go back to what I said before. To that extent, it's not that different than any other big new technology that has arrived before. It's all about how you think through, how am I going to put this thing to work? And I think we have a bit more time on the commercial side than we might have originally feared when ChatGPT first arrived in the end of 2022, and we all thought unemployment would be 80% by next week. And it's not. That's all I'd say. I think that's great advice and a great way to end the podcast. It'll be exciting to see how it all takes shape in 2024. And thanks again for those of you joining us at Riskology by Infortal.